Hello and welcome to Brit Sci-Fi from the National Space Centre. A huge thank you for joining us once again and to all of our guests and contributors for giving their time freely and making this weekend so special. So over to another guest. Uh, as a child, Mark always daydreamed that his teddy bear went off on the top secret missions when he was at school. At the age of 17, he sold his first comedy material to Radio 4 and at 18, he was writing for Smith & Jones on BBC One. He studied philosophy at the University of Reading and more recently has created the award-winning Spy Toys book uh, series of books, I apologise, and last month Bloomsbury published Space Detectives, which was described as immensely cheerily silly by The Guardian. His interests include tea drinking, fantastic, uh, and dinosaurs, so please do welcome our very special Brit Sci-Fi guest, Mark Powers. Good afternoon, Mark. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you for having me. Great no, brilliant. Um, I think it's very important that when we look at British science fiction, we are not just doing movies and TV. It can't just be that. There is so much more to the genre. So, And, and I think when we start looking at, at books where we're using imagination, and certainly for children's imagination, it's very important that you're here. So thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. I sounded awfully patronising. I've done it three <laughs> times now. I just, I d well done. <laughs> I, I try. I, do, I, oh, I don't know. What am I like? Uh, so we've had some questions submitted, so um, I'm going to ask you a few questions. So we'll kick off with a nice, easy one. So uh, first question is, uh, did you know that you always wanted to be a writer? Um, pretty much, yeah, I'd say. I mean, in one way or another, I always was a writer. Writing was what I enjoyed doing. Way, way back in, in primary school, I remember enjoying writing stories and um, if, they were, if they were good sometimes, a teacher reading them out to the class, which I think is a very uh, common way that people get interested in writing when they get that first bit of attention for it. Um, but yeah, definitely writing has is, is always been my thing, really. Fantastic, thank you. I do apologise. Brit Sci-Fi Cat has just arrived, so if you see a cat going across the <laughs> screen, it's just Bertie. Um, oh, so, the delights of working from home. Um, at least it's not like NASA and we have to worry about the cat walking on the keyboard and setting off a rocket somewhere. Uh, oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we have... There we go. There's, there's, there's Bertie Tail. Um, we have an audience of families, children and adults with us today, so a really mixed audience, which is fantastic. Um, but if you were to give some advice to anybody wanting to become a writer, um, obviously there's lots of different stages of life, but what, what advice would you give? Um, well, there's two really um, simple bits of, of advice I would give. There's just two things that you, you need to do if you want to be a writer, really. Uh, very, very simple. And that's read a lot and write a lot um it's, it's really that simple i mean if you if you read lots and lots then you you start to absorb um how your favorite authors write how they create their worlds and their characters how they use language all that will rub off on you and the more you practice writing the better your own writing will get um obviously when it comes down to the sort of more more technical aspects of writing, like kind of uh, prose and uh, uh, story structure and all that stuff. There's there's plenty of books out there to help you. Um, Stephen King's book on writing um, I found particularly useful. Um, but those those sort of aspects of craft you can you can learn about those in books. But what you really really must do though is simply read a lot and write a lot. And if you enjoy reading and writing, then you're training yourself to be a writer. Brilliant. I think I was really lucky because uh, uh, at primary school, uh, we had a fantastic teacher who really did instill that passion for reading. Uh, and I can remember at an early age reading The Hobbit and, and just going yeah. off. And I, I disappeared for a day going off on my journey looking for the ring. You know, I was I was I was going off. I was looking for uh, I was, no, I was I was looking for dragons. I wasn't looking for rings at that point. But yes. And it was brilliant. And I just loved the fact that Every time I read something, my imagination took me on a very different story. And, and I think that's a really nice part of the journey. So, yeah, read a lot. Great advice. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so we've got uh, a question. So is it difficult to swap from writing for different genres? So uh, I alluded in the beginning to some of the other work that you've done, but you've got a really diverse base of things that you've written. Um, so <laughs> do you approach things differently? Are there different hats? Do you wear a different top? <laughs> 
Um, I, I could probably do with some new hats, actually. But um, I, actually, there isn't that great a, a sort of um, change required from moving from one type of writing to another. Because basically, you're trying to, try to tell a story that's going to keep people interested. You want people to try to keep listening or uh, keep turning the pages. So it's pretty much the same skills you're using as a writer, just trying to hold people's attention, basically. Fantastic. Thank you. And I, I think, I mean, it's not about patronising children either, is it? So we're not we're not dumbing down things. It's it's and having fun, I would imagine. I should imagine you you enjoy what you do. So if that then goes onto the page. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I I mean, I, I don't hold with writers who say, oh, it's all torture. I hate it. I hate it. I mean, obviously, it is hard just as anything that's worth doing, just as any kind of achievement should be hard for it to be worthwhile. Yeah, it's definitely hard, but that doesn't mean it can't be fun. And fantastic. Um, you must get some really good um, uh, enjoyment from what you do, seeing people enjoy what you've created. It's, uh, it's a lovely oh, part yeah, of the process. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's great when I do school events because obviously writing is a very... Um, can be quite a sort of lonely process, which which is you know it can be part of the attraction, but also you know it can be uh, quite a lonely business just you and the, the laptop. So to get out and to do school events and to hear um, kids laughing at jokes you put in stuff is really rewarding, you know. And that aspect of being an author, the travelling about, meeting people, doing signings, all that stuff, that's the real kind of nice side. That's the that's the kind of cherry on the, the cake, you know, that's the nice bit that comes after all the hard work. Mm. Brilliant, I love that. Um, if you need any hats, by the way, um, I believe fezzies are cool, so... Um... Oh, yes, absolutely, yes. <laughs> Grab yourself a fez. Um, so uh, when I introduced you, I said about uh, that you uh, sold comedy to Radio 4 when you were 17 and wrote yes. material for Smith & Jones on BBC One when you were 18. So um, how did this happen? Um, I'm not questioning your talent. It's just the route that you, <laughs> you went down. Uh, how did you, you do, do that? Well, you, you wouldn't be the first person to question my talent. <laughs> um, well, I mean, as I, as I sort of mentioned earlier, writing... Um, began in school for me and then when I moved to comprehensive school uh, school I went to in North Wales um, me and my friend Richard used to write comedy sketches together and we'd record them on tape and we'd use um, those uh, BBC sound effects albums I've dug one out today to show you there's a cassette of um, sound effects that we would use in our sketches um, and we were influenced by things like um, Hancock and the Goon Show and uh, particularly um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy so Richard and I wrote sketches together for about five years which is quite a long time to do it really. he got reasonably proficient at it I would say and then after after five years I was, I was going into the sixth form and Richard left school to join the RAF, and I sort of wanted to continue with the comedy writing. I was really enjoying it. And I happened to read in a book by Neil Gaiman called Don't Panic, which was um, the first sort of biography of Douglas Adams to come out in about 1987, I think. Um, he mentioned in that that Douglas Adams used to produce a show on Radio 4, The Week Ending, and producing this show was always a very junior job given to people in radio light entertainment and it struck me that if you have junior people producing this show maybe that they would give junior writers a go so um and weekending was a sort of a uh, topical comedy show it was on every week and it had kind of sketches and sort of news jokes based on the, the week's events the week's news um so i got sunday papers and i typed out a page of jokes on my typewriter which is um, what IT uh, constituted back in the late 80s, for me anyway. And, uh, yeah, I posted a page of jokes to the BBC, tuned into the programme the following Friday, and uh, much to my amazement, they used one of my jokes on the show. And there was my name on the credits. And my joke was read out by an actor called David Tate, who had been in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So this was um, a really big thrill for the... 17-year-old me, 
Um, so I kept doing jokes for weekending. They started sending me contracts and money. Um, I started writing for another show called The News Headlines, which was the same kind of topical sketches, but this time in front of an audience, so you can actually hear people laughing at your jokes and sketches. Um, and I've been doing that for about a year, maybe 18 months or so, and I got a letter um, inviting me to write some stuff for Smith & Jones, who were just about to start filming um, their sketch show, which was transferring from BBC Two to BBC One. Um, so, you know, I sent in like a stack of material kind of that thick um, and that they used a few bits on the program, you know, and I still get occasional um, payments and things, but TV repeats in Finland and stuff like that. Um, but that was my kind of um, entry into the world of script writing and it all started quite, quite young. Thank goodness for Finnish repeats is all I can say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can remember going to the library and going downstairs into the audio department and going through the BBC records for the sound effects. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah so. I mean, I'm pretty obsessed by all those records on the BBC label. Oh, uh, my, my friend Tim is writing a book that's going to catalogue every one of them, which I'm really looking forward to. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, I mean, yeah, hours were spent listening to The Goon Show and, and Hancock's Half Hour. I'll always remember, I mean, The Blood Donor's the obvious one, but it's always the missing page for me. Uh, oh, and yeah. <laughs> Harry Zimmerman. Oh, Harry Zimmerman. Just yeah. brilliant. Such, such good stuff. So, yeah, lovely. I think that leads us quite well on to our next question because um, you have mentioned a few names there that might pop up. But um, the next question is, who inspired you as an author? Um, are there any writers or, or others today that you can't wait for their next publication? Or do you have any historical authors that you keep going back to read? Well, um, yes, lots and lots and lots. I mean, um, as, I, as I mentioned, Douglas Adams was uh, probably my most important influence growing up. Uh, and it was kind of my way into a lot of sort of classic British humour, kind of Oxbridge humour stuff like Not the Nine O'Clock News and Python and uh, particularly uh, Blackadder as well, which I was a massive, massive fan of and think that script writing, uh, especially in the later series, was um, just absolutely terrific. Um, yeah, so those guys, that kind of English absurdist humour, um, P.G. Woodhouse, um, another absolutely fantastic writer who um, I really, really adored. A um, little bit more recently, Sue Townsend, the writer I adored. She, of course, did uh, the Adrian Mole series, uh, plus lots and lots of other really, really great books. So I think they're sort of among my favourite comic writers. Classic writers, um, I mean, I've always loved Oscar Wilde, um, as we speak, rereading um, Picture of Dorian Gray, um, uh, you know, his stuff you can return to endlessly. Uh, Dorian Gray is a really kind of exhausting book to read because every sentence is a little masterpiece. Um, so that's, that's fantastic. Um, Conan Doyle I love as well love all the Holmes stories. And just recently I've been trying to find some of his lesser known books. Uh, there's one um, I, I read recently, which is his version of um, a, a story about Atlantis, which is really, really interesting, really good fun. Um, so yeah, lots and lots of different writers really. People, people with a sense of humour more often than not. I think you've stolen my list there. <laughs> my 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 um objective in life is to play the role uh to be able to say the line a handbag um in the importance of being honest i just want to do that one line that's it um so uh yeah oh sue townsend brilliant she um she's obviously she's from leicester uh so uh yeah. she wrote yeah she wrote a book um i think it was called the woman who went to bed for a year um, That's right. yes. And it's based at the National Space Centre in Leicester. So there's a whole scene in it where she writes. Oh, yes. right. yeah, she writes about what the scientists get up to in the clean rooms. And I just like to say we don't have any clean rooms, and <laughs> we don't do that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, brilliant book, great characters. Uh, Adrian Mole, obviously, with me from an early age. Um, so let's move on slightly to the book uh, that has just um, come out, uh, so Space Detectives. Uh, but it's not your first book that has been set against the backdrop of space. So does space inspire you? Because I know it's cool. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, 
again, space is one of those things I've always loved since I was a kid. Um, stuff like, um, let me see, oh, Reg Turnal, the uh, space editor on Newsround, those little snippets of news about space. I always found those really fascinating as a kid. Any any um, any factual shows about space. Or, uh, when I was growing up in the 70s, there was um, still a little bit of um, stuff going on in the space race, so that was fascinating. Um, and, of course, all the great science fiction as well. Growing up in the 70s, we had Doctor Who, um, Blake Seven, um, and, of course, we had all the great... Um, all the great American stuff, the Star Trek as well. So, yeah, definitely space has been a big sort of part of my life one way or another, either fiction or fact. Brilliant, thank you. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about Space Detectives? Yeah, definitely. So um, Space Detectives is set in the future and it's about two, uh, two boys, Connor and Ethan, who live on board an enormous space station called Starville. Uh, Starville is like a huge, uh, it's like London floating through the sky, orbiting the Earth, home to thousands of uh, humans and aliens. And um, in this first uh, space detective's adventure, someone or something has uh, tampered with Starville's guidance system and uh, caused the space station um, to uh, shoot off on a collision course with the moon. Um, and it's up to Connor and Ethan to uh, try and figure out who's responsible and how they can save the day. Fantastic. And where did you get the idea from? Well, the characters Connor and Ethan I'd had for a long, long time. They were originally in a, uh, a short play I wrote for Contact Young Actors Company here in Manchester years and years ago. Um, so I'd always had these, these two characters, Connor, the sort of... Um, thoughtful, shy one, and Ethan, the more kind of uh, impulsive, uh, spiky one. Um, and I was looking for um, looking for a, a place I could put them, really, to, to uh, generate stories. And I was thinking, uh, ooh, let me see, well, some kind of, having them um, solve mysteries is good. Where can they solve mysteries? Well, space space is good but how can, how can they solve mysteries in space do they live in space well uh they could be on a spaceship or a space station that would give you easy access to space a space station in the future could be um, a place where lots of different alien species um live so that could be that could be a, a way to generate stories so it was the coming together of those different strands really Brilliant, thank you. Um, I've obviously seen a copy of the book, um, and one of the things that really stands out is is the cover art and the illustration. Um, oh, have you got a copy? Yay, there it is. Yeah. They are brilliant. Um, the illustrator, Dapo, um, yeah. has done some amazing work on it. Um, but how does it work? How, what is the relationship between the creative writer and the illustrator? How do you take what's in your head and, and give that to Dapo, and then he creates something and that you're happy with. Yeah, he's fantastic. Um, it's Generally, it's done via the publisher. So once the text is complete and um, the publisher and I are happy with it, then um, it'll get laid out on the page. And um, every so often, there will be a gap. Uh, where we want to have an illustration and there'll be a little briefing note in there saying a uh, picture of the space station here or a picture of the characters there. Um, normally fairly um, reasonably specific. Um, and then it's up to the, uh, the guy with the pencil to do his magic, really. So do you, if you, I don't know how the process works, but if you hadn't liked what had been created, do you have any say in that whatsoever? Or is it always a case that, that the publisher works with such professional individuals that what you get is, is so good? Um, well, yeah, especially in the case of space, space detectives, I really wanted to work with Dapo because he's just so great. And I knew that, you know, uh, uh, I, I always said I was in charge when I was writing it, but he was in charge when it came to visualising it because I just couldn't wait to see what he was going to make of it. And I'm really happy with the look he's produced for the 
the characters and the settings. Um, I do get, I mean, the writer has a bit of input, say if there's a particular scene that I really want to see, then, uh, then I might speak up about that. Uh, but generally, um, people know what they're doing and, you know, usually changes are fairly minor. Obviously, uh, an illustrator can work with great characters to create great illustrations. So um, your characters, I think you've you started to answer this question a little bit, but do you have a fully rounded character before you begin, begin the story or do you find that they evolve throughout or is it a bit of both? It's usually a bit of both, yeah. I mean, I have these, these, two, uh, these two characters of Ethan and Connor in a, in a very kind of rough form. But I think... Um, yeah, you get you get writers who write the entire biography of the character before they start writing the story, you know, which is which is one way to do it. If that works for them, then great. But generally, I find that character and story are quite kind of closely meshed. So if you start writing the story, as long as you have a, a fairly clear idea of your character's personality and the the really kind of important things that have happened to them and what the character wants, then the story normally kind of falls into place once you've got the characters right. Thank you very much for that. Um, we, we sort of started talking about the creative process, but we know it's very different for everybody. I was listening to an interview from Ben Aronovich the other day, and he was saying he was really confused by this concept of the rewrite. Um, so do you find that you put the story down on the page and that's it, it's done? Or, or do you have to walk away and come back and, and, and re-edit your work? Absolutely, you have to put it away and then come back to it. The longer you put it away, uh, the fresher your eyes when you look at it again and the more objective you can be about it. You know, the old, the old saying is writing is rewriting. Um, the first draft of anything is normally pretty rubbish. Um, it's funny, I was reading an interview with um, a guy called John Swartzwelder who wrote many of the greatest episode of the simpsons back in the 90s and he would say that when he was writing an episode of the simpsons he would just make the first draft really quick really rubbish not even put any jokes in it but just get that done in one day so then when he looked at it the next day um he had something to work with and the rewriting bit adding the jokes was the fun bit so once he got the kind of horrible structural bit out of the way he could enjoy adding the jokes um, so that's one way you can do it. I, I think I might have seen the cartoon series that came before the, the next part of the process that wasn't The Simpsons, I hate, hasten to add, but I've seen some terrible cartoon series recently <laughs> that, that didn't have any jokes but definitely had the structure of a really bad story. <laughs> Oh, that's the point of uh, lockdown where you've watched everything that there is on all of the channels, on all of the television. And, you know, you just sit through things at this point. Um, so you've already said that you run workshops in schools. Um, and I mean, there are some fantastic things that you do. Obviously, you took science fiction and this looking at different areas of science fiction with children and uh, looking at how to create stories uh, on the page. And um, 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 kids have the most amazing imagination. But do you find that that helps you develop your stories because you can see what kids are getting up to and what they're in touch with and what's... Feel the kids' ideas. No, no, I don't mean all the ideas, <laughs> but, you know, there, there must be a point where, you know, the iPod came in or, you know, that the skateboarding became cool again or, you know, so, so sort of you follow those fashions. But also when you're talking about what you're creating or you're talking about science fiction, the feedback that you get from their excitement, that must help you in that process. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, if you're going to write for children, you have to, to a certain extent, sort of keep your ear to the ground um, to find out what kids are interested in. But mostly, I mean, mostly it's the same things. Mostly kids' interests haven't really changed. I mean, they're interested in, in toys, they're interested in pets, they're interested in holidays, they're interested in friendship. These sorts of things don't change ever, but um, how they're realised on the page, how they operate from generation to generation, how they work in your story, that's the stuff that changes, that's the stuff that you have to invent. But I think kids, kids, you know, like, like human nature in general, haven't really changed that much over the years. Um, it, I mean, yeah, it, it is great to go into schools and do, uh, and do workshops 
Um, there's been science fiction workshops I've I've led where we we invent stories, we look at the different genres of science fiction, and um, try to create a story in, a, in each of the different kind of subgenres. Um, and there's been um, workshops I've done where we've looked at writing technique and this um, show don't tell business um, that everybody talks about in writing and how, how important that is. Um, and, and again, I'm always amazed at the, the ideas that um, children come up with when we try to think of examples. Um, so, I mean, it is very kind of refreshing to go into schools and to encounter, you know, new new readers, new writers with kind of fresh ideas and fresh takes on things. It's really exciting. Kids haven't changed at all. My mum still tells me that um, she had a plastic um, orange linen basket that I used to put on top of my head and run around and pretend I was a Dalek. And um, I now share my house with a Dalek. So, you know, no <laughs> changes. <laughs> yeah, we all did that. Yeah, I'm we sure. All did that in the 70s. Yeah, I'm sure all kids do the same <laughs> stuff still today. I'm sure there's some Dalek kids out there somewhere. Yeah, there was there was a school event I did, and one kid told me that he's the first word he ever spoke was exterminate. <laughs> <laughs> Mine was Eddie for teddy bear because I couldn't say the t on Teddy, so it was Eddie. I can't remember what what mine was. It's probably something like asteroid. <laughs> oh, you see, mine's just what my mum tells me. I can't remember it, but so she probably just makes it up. <laughs> yeah, you know, stories. Is yeah, all good stories. Um, so your Bloomsbury biog says that your favourite animals are binturong, the eye eye, and the dodo. Why these animals? And have you, <laughs> and have you ever smelt a binturong, which apparently smells of buttered popcorn? They do, yes. Um, I can't remember where I saw one. Either. My partner and I are big fans of zoos, and we go to um, zoos all up and down the country, and we... I have seen a binturong. I have indeed smelt one, and they do have this weird popcorn smell. Um, the other animal is dodo. Dodos, I've always loved dodos. As a kid, um, obviously, you know, obsessed with dinosaurs. You'd see in dinosaur books, there might be little, I mean, like a subsection of the book about other extinct animals, and you'd get things like... Um, Tasmanian tiger and stuff, and then there'd be the dodo, the kind of uh, uh, exemplar of the uh, more recently extinct animal. And I've always had a slight kind of uh, fascination for the dodo whenever I'm in a uh, natural history museum that has dodo bits and bones there. I always have to go and check it out. Um, yeah, so I've always loved dodos. Um, what's the other one? The eye eye. Yeah, well, the eye eye. It's one of those, um, it's a really freaky looking thing. Um, it's, it's this um, nocturnal lemur uh, that has this extremely long and skeletal finger that it uses to tap on um, uh, the, the bark of trees to listen for insects underneath. Uh, because it eats insects and it lives in an environment that has no woodpeckers, so it fills that um, ecological niche. Um, crazy, crazy animals. I'm always, um, I'm always drawn to the kind of uh, less obvious creatures, and they're quite good for comedy purposes as well, of course. Because uh, as any uh, comedy writer will tell you, animals are a good source of humour. Um, so yes, I've always liked um, kind of strange creatures, and I enjoy making them up as well. We've got quite a few in Space Detectives, including um, something called, called a tufted grot snobbler, and um, <laughs> there's another creature called a snarl-toothed grizzloid as well. So yeah, strange animals um, I'm, I'm really into. They sound brilliant. I think we I think we should definitely have some pictures of those and, and, and let's have a look at National Geographic doing a special on those ones. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um I mean I I mean I love the II. There's um Westminster Safari Park have got the Bat Cave and we went in because we thought we might find Batman, but apparently not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um and if you can get over the smell, because bats there's a not it's not the nicest yeah. of odors, but they have eye eyes in there because they're nocturnal and they like the dark spaces and and everybody's just standing around looking up trying to see these eye eyes and getting covered in whatever it is the bats are dropping 
Um, it's a great experience. You should try it. Perfect way to spend an afternoon. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> um, if you ever come and visit us in Leicester, uh, check out Twycross Zoo. They've got some fantastic oh, animals. I've been, yeah. Yeah. It's lovely. It's really nice. And and at the moment, um, there's the snow leopards, so you can sit and have a cup of coffee and watch the entire family is walking past. It's really nice. Wow. It's a lovely place. And you're in his dark materials. <laughs> that would be nice. I'll go and have a look for my my golden compass somewhere. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, well, um, I've got a, a a question over here. So the IT guy has reminded me that I need to ask you. Um, I said that the Space Detectives book is just out, but what are you working on now? Is there anything next that we've got to look forward to? What should we look for? Um, Can you tell there's going to be there's going to be some more Space Detectives. Um, space Detectives. Uh, two um extra weird creatures is out in august and then um early next year we've got a third space detectives book called cosmic pet puzzle um so plenty of um mysteries to keep connor and ethan occupied um after that well um oh yes there's a very exciting project coming which i've been working on which unfortunately i can't talk about so not uh, it's not officially announced yet but uh, more exciting things to come i could tell you but i'd have to kill you my, uh, <laughs> absolutely <yes. laughs> well we'll look forward to the books anyway so my and finally question is have you booked your ticket to starville yet oh yeah i have but unfortunately the waiting list is 227 years long <laughs> Nearly the same length as SpaceX then, so you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we'll be at that by by very soon. We'll be able to get to that age. Um, Mark, it's been fantastic chatting with you. Thank you so much. Um, oh, thank you for having me. No, you're very welcome. Um, hopefully everybody will go out and buy the book because it, it does sound fantastic. There you go. Let's get a, a shot. Uh, left a bit, right yep. a bit. There you go. That's it. <laughs> Technology. Technology. There we go. That's it, technology. I'll tell you what, I'll take me off the screen and then people can see it. There we go. So there that's it, Space Detectives, uh, Mark Powers there and Dapo's on the front as well. Um, it's been lovely talking to you. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. Brilliant, and it's been fantastic talking to Mark. Do go over and check out Space Detectives. And of course, we have some more Space Detectives coming up very soon this year and next. Uh, do enjoy the rest of the festival. Do check out the programme. There's lots of things for you to enjoy. And also check out the National Space Centre's website, where we hope to be opening to the public uh, very soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>